Hello everybody, uh, I will give you a talk about the Python environment and the pain of dealing with it. This talk is for beginners, but here beginners means anybody that never had to um, productionize a Python uh, code base, let's say. So this can include uh, data scientists that have many years of experiences but never produce their own module, for example, or like people coming from other languages where you have a, a different approach to the problems I will present. And uh, it's, a, it's a talk of pointers, not a talk of content. So the, the goal is not to send you home with new knowledge about the Python environment, but more to to send you home with the means to research it yourself. Because for all the categories I mentioned before, it might be uh, confusing because there are, as the title implies, there are names that don't really uh, give an idea of what they do. So this is, this is the plan. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Simone Rabutti. Uh, I come from Italy, where I studied computer science uh, and where I was firstly exposed to Python. Uh, I work as a mach I always worked as a machine learning engineer slash data engineer, both in Italy and then here. I work at Teraki. Uh, for I've been working there for two years, and what we do is data compression using machine learning. If you've watched uh, Silicon Valley, the TV series, that's what they do. In the first three seasons, we do it without violating any information theory hard law. We do it for real on cars. Uh, if there's a, so in my free time, I follow a bunch of projects. Uh, if you are Italian, you might know me as a founder of Gambero, that is the Italian brother of Lobsters. It's a community for programmers. I'm a blogger. I blog about Python. I blog about technology, politics, bunch of topics. I'm also here in Berlin, an organ uh, the organizer of the Learning Group of Tech Worker Coalition. I invite everybody to uh, look it up on Google, Facebook, or Twitter because it might be of interest for everybody in this room. And so we can begin. But first, I want to give a disclaimer. I will present a lot of problems that are everywhere in the Python environment. And these problems, I regard them as systemic problems. So it's not a problem of a single tool. It's not a problem of a single developer that made a bad decision. These problems arise from the complexity and historical legacy reasons of how the Python um, ecosystem developed. So this is not an attack on any single tool. Actually, the ones I will uh, criticize the most, uh, criticize the most because they deal with harder problems, not because they are inherently worse. Um, so there's a pattern for that any, every, uh, senior Python engineer can relate to of seeing your, uh, your tools work until they break unexpectedly. And this is a pattern that uh, will create, will give you a lot of pain. So the only, uh, let's say, advice I, I will really give you in this talk is to stick to the Bitham path. Don't try uh, minor uh, features of your uh, of the tools I'm going to present, especially the ones for packaging and distribution. Try the main. Don't don't use the precated stuff. It's going to ruin your life. Your working life, at least. Um, and yes, and also the other, as I said, uh, Python tools have very confusing names. So this talk is also a way to map where each one of them fits in this, in the big picture. To help you guide, to give you an emotional guide to how, what it means to, to deal with this tool, I came up with the, with the, why the fuck are you broken now scale that goes from one to five. Uh, one means you forget they exist, everything works. Five means that you cried at least once using them. And also, I would like to divide them by scope because most of these tools overlap in the things they do. They don't just pertain to a single, uh, to a single problem. They, they try to solve more than, than one at once. And so it's useful again to divide them by 
by what they try they are trying to do and i present five problems uh one is packaging packaging in this context means to bundle up your code your c dependencies because python support that uh and metadata for the project and everything you want like also data file config file sometimes it's done this way in a single artifact most likely an archive format of some kind in python there are a bunch of these formats uh the most most likely you have seen egg files they are bad and wheel files they are okay uh if you see z portar or other weird stuff i i don't know i luckily it never happened to me in the real world distribution means how to move these packages and make them run on other machines that are not yours or maybe uh, distribute them to the public or to other organizations like your customers and and all the problems that are related with it environment management this is a a bit more specific to python it means how to handle your virtual environments so uh, where virtual environments are a way in python to divide your dependencies so that's the ultimate goal of of virtual environments and also not to break your python level uh, your system level python installation because if you start installing weird stuff you don't know what happens and then two minor um topics are testing uh that in this case doesn't mean to write tests it means to run tests and uh enforcing code style that include linting so verify that your code meets a standard guideline that luckily in python we have pep8 and but also auto formatting so solve these problems automatically i would like to show you i don't know if it's readable yeah um a couple of errors that i encounter i encountered too too often uh in my experience in teraki uh because in teraki i had the chance to um create the the whole python code base from scratch and i wanted to make it nice everything modular modularized properly and um packaged properly with a template for every project that was uniform everything nice and perfect so i could invest some time to make it proper and but i made a big mistake uh underestimating the complexity or or let's say the problems that would arise in the long term that I couldn't spot in the beginning. And the big mistake I made was to use git dependencies instead of saving my uh I know I see you are laughing and so you can relate to my pain. Uh I used git dependencies from our internal big bucket instead of building the packages and putting them on a server like you're supposed to do. And I think somewhere there were egg files instead of wheel files because that's the default behavior uh but in the way I, with the template I was using and so you end up with these errors that have a lot of concepts that you didn't know about because you you just wanted to make to install a package and it's much longer than this actually and this appears with this is much more recent but it happens a bit Oops. Um one sec. Um okay. Um and this is from poetry and it's actually an error related to a tool I'm not using that poetry is invoking uh, internally. Uh and it's all the suggested solutions uh are not viable because I'm not actually touching this tool so it's out it's very hard to fix it with the suggested solutions another one that i love this is this appears only when you use git dependencies these appear when you are installing a package and you specify your uh git repository links in a given format but the package you want to install use a different format so you end up with a list of these dependencies where you have a string that contains a comma separated list of the other package dependencies and the list of strings of your own dependencies mixed up together and it crashes and it i spent that's where i cried 
probably. Uh, because I had to debug internally and still I'm not sure about my diagnosis. But when you are confronted with this stuff just because you're installing a package, you really want to cry. Uh, I also, well, it looks bad on this screen. I created a, um, a concept map of where all these packages, all these tools fit. These are the tools I will mention in the talk. There are a lot. Uh, I won't read them, all of them extensively, but, and they left out linting. But I will show you this map again in the end to uh, uh, allow you to get pictures or to make sense of what I just said. So now we can move to our tools. I start with setup tools because it's somebody that it's something that everybody probably um, got in contact with, and is the it's a core Python tool, so it's bundled together with a normal Python installation, and its purpose again it's uh, to package and. Uh, install in your local system uh, the the project you are working on, uh, but also to install the dependencies. So it does dependency resolution. It does a bunch of stuff. Uh, it, it's the, it was originally an attempt uh, on, let's say, fix all these systemic problems uh, that came from another tool that we'll talk about that is this utils. Uh, I'm not an expert on the history of this because it's very, there's not a lot of documentation or like written history. You need to really dig to understand what was behind many of these decisions. I give it a four what the fuck out of five because it really centralizes all the problems and this guy is always there when something goes wrong. It's n not often its direct fault, but you know, it's a four out of five. The, the guy I really hate is these utils. These utils was the precursor to setup tools. There are still many packages floating around built with uh, these utils. Uh, don't use it directly. It's deprecated, but it's still distributed with Python. And it does, pre it tries to do the same stuff of setup tools. Setup tools actually extended the scope. Uh, but this is a full five out of five just because you see it mentioned. Everywhere, everywhere, every time something breaks unexpectedly, somehow this utils is involved. Again, this happens because of egg format. This happens because somebody somewhere is using uh, deprecated stuff. In that case, which was me. But you know, in an open source, like Python is heavily built on open source environments. And especially if you are a data scientist, maybe you are trying to install something that has been installed, has been created many years ago. Maybe there weren't, there wasn't even an alternative. And when you install it with pip, everything works. Then you pass the same set of dependencies to, to a developer and they break because you are installing them with setup tools. Yeah. Another thing I didn't mention is that in Terraki, I didn't want to use pip. I was installing only through setup tools. And that was another very poor decision. Pip, I think everybody is familiar with Pip because otherwise it's very, very hard to bring Python code in your system, so much so that it became a core uh, tool in the Python distribution. So the goal of Pip is to literally download packages from a remote server or even from a local uh, um, directory and install them in your current environment. It's a one out of five because it works. You rarely people, uh, people complain about pip. The, it has some weird uh, standards. Like, for example, again, if you use Git dependencies, pip has a different format than setup tools, but just slightly. So a, a matter of comma and semicolons and stuff like that. So if you want to use a requirements text uh, from setup tools and you have Git dependencies, it doesn't work anymore. But except from that, it's a one out of five. Then we have PyP. What is PyP? PyP is the cent it's where you find the packages that normally you install with pip. It's a central index uh, of packages that uh, are, you know, open source, publicly available. It's uh, managed by the Python community, or I'm not sure exactly who is behind it, but um, it's necessary to the ecosystem. The name is not really telling because it stands, I think, for 
Python index. I never never looked into it. Uh, and there is no alternative. Like everybody puts their stuff there. Uh, it's a three out of five, not to be, not because it's that terrible, but because uh, publishing to PyPy is, according to me, unnecess- unnecessarily complex. Uh, like you can use a tool called Twine. It's a bit convoluted. It's not in other languages. It's even worse. But still, it's you cry a bit sometimes. But then it when it works once, it always works. Uh, if you instead want to keep these packages inside your organization, uh, you can rather install your own server. There are many options for this. Like there are many more alternatives than those two. Um, but PyP server is the most common, I would say. So this is a way to uh, replicate the behavior or of PyP in your company, for example, where I, uh, you can push uh, build packages and download them. And it's a bit, ha- it's a three out of five because it's not super straightforward to set up considering how simple it's the work done by PyP server, but then it works. Like when it's stable, it stays stable and it's a 3 out of 5 also because configuring extra repositories in um, in the Python environment using setup tools, poetry, many other tools, every time it's different. So it's there are too many ways to do it. Not there are not none of them is hard, but there are too many ways to do it. And this reflects a bit poorly on PyP server because on PyP it's the default option. You don't need to specify it. If you want a custom option, there are too many ways to do it. Okay, we talked about packaging and distribution. Now we move to environments. This is another tool that maybe the majority here is familiar with, and it's virtualenv. It's a command line utility to create and handle, uh, no, just to create virtual environments. Um, It's now regarded as a low-level tool, like it's not really uh, the best option to use it directly. I still do it because it leaves me a lot of control. And, but I don't suggest to use it directly. Also, um, there is VM that many people believe it's the exact same thing and it's not. Uh, it's, it does the same job, but it's, it's been introduced in Python 3 and it, Again, it allows you to create uh, virtual environments. Uh, they behave exactly the same. But the community still sticks to virtual env for whatever reason. Me, me too. So I'm. Um, because virtual env works well enough. It's a two out of five because it, it, it delivers. The, um, the only complaint I can have is about some, sometimes it does some caching that it's not super obvious and it does. Uh, it copies around a lot of packages, so it takes more memory than it could. V- for what I understand, VM is better in this regard, but again, uh, verify this information because it's not something I researched as much as the rest. I mentioned as the, an alternative the containers because uh, we have seen today a couple of talks about Docker and Python, and for some problems, containers are better. Like, you don't really want to put some projects into packages and deliver them through all this stuff. So if you want to separate your dependencies, sometimes it's much, much easier to create a container and uh, work through the containers. Um, another tool that is not obvious at all from the name is PyEnv. And PyEnv, as, as a goal, the, um, the purpose is to... Um, handle different Python versions in the same system transparently. So you can specify a PyEnv version as an environment variable where you uh, change the version you care about, or you can have a .python version file that tells you like the version you you want to use in a specific directory. And PyEnv does some shell black magic to run the right executable behind the scene and so you don't have to care about it. Uh, it can be used together with virtualenv to perform the same trick. There's a plugin. I never used it. I don't even use pyenv, but if you support multiple Python versions, it might be handy for your development flow. It's a 2 out of 5 because I've seen some complaints because it being shell magic, it means that 
it doesn't behave consistently across systems. It almost always works, but again, on some on some machines it might break or might be hard to configure. Pipenv, after presenting all these options, might make sense. Like the name is telling, like it's a mix of pip and virtual environment. So it's a tool to separate again your uh, dependencies, but also to install uh, through pip the dependencies you care about. So you can specify a, a pip file, uh, like it's called pip file in the, as the main file, uh, that contains your uh, dependencies instead of using like a requirements.txt file. And if you use pipenv, it will create automatic and manage automatically an environment containing exactly those dependencies. So, you know, you don't mix up stuff across different projects. This is quite common in, in the open source. You will see it around, even if you don't have to package your own software, it's very common uh, if you need to contribute to some open source project to find a pip file. But this pip env is a bit uh, limited in scope and some people don't really love it that much. I never use it that extensively. Uh, and the new cool thing is poetry. Uh, that, is it cool? Yes. Is it perfect? No. Uh, why? Oh, so poetry, what does it do? Uh, everything. It tries to solve all the problems we have presented so far in a single solution with a single logic, a single way of doing things. Does it deliver that? Yes, it's still not mature. Uh, it's usable, so use it. I invite everybody to, to use poetry. It's still not established as a practice. It's still not super mature. And I give it a two out of five because it's, you will still need to handle all the legacy stuff I told you about and poetry won't save you from that. Uh, it's good, but not good enough to solve all these problems. So, like the errors I've showed you before, it happens. Uh, in a world where everything is done in poetry, maybe you won't see this, but in 2019, that's what we have. It's possibly the best option we have, but try it, try it. Um, let's move uh, to testing. That is actually the name of this uh, track. And this talk is not about testing, I'm sorry. Um, Tox is useful to handle testing environments where in this context, it means the uh, Python version and environment variables that belong to your environment and options uh, that you want to support. And it basically runs all your tests according to these specs for environments. And it's, uh, and on that it delivers. It's not the most obvious tool to, to use in an advanced fashion. So it's a two out of five because the basic is very easy. Then it gets a bit, bit trickier. I never, tr I never use talks to actually do the hard part of it. You can also use bash scripting. You can use CI pipelines. It's much more common, but talks is the best thing if you need to support multiple Python versions and you have big differences, for example, between your testing, staging, and production environment. So your tests need to behave differently. Um, PyTest, uh, it was mentioned before uh, by somebody in, in, in the crowd. Uh, PyTest is uh, the most popular, I would say, not the most used, but at least the most popular testing suite in Python. And uh, I mention it here because not because you, you, you need it to handle your workflow or your project, but still it, it's so, uh, powerful in its features, especially for filtering and, uh, parameterizing, uh, tests that it end up being relevant in, for example, in the RCI pipelines, because you want to separate them according to, um, the kind of test that you have. So it has a powerful uh, way to label your test and filter them accordingly. And so it's still relevant for this level of management of your project if you use it as it's supposed to. It's a lot of black magic. So when something goes wrong, it's not common, but when something goes wrong, don't look into the source code. 
No, I, I had uh, stories of people never coming back from that source code. Uh, it's it's powerful, but yeah, it's it's obscure. That it gets a two out of five because it breaks. There, there's a there are a bunch of niche weird behaviors. One that might have happened to many of you is that if you run pytest with coverage using a plugin called pytestcov that is the most common, you break the debugger of PyCharm. And if you research this on the internet, um, the developers of PyCharm say that it's their fault, and they say that it's PyCharm fault, and so this no, is not going to get fixed by anybody, because they, they, they conflict on how they handle the, the interpreter, or something like that. Um, so you have to, if you have the coverage uh, enabled by default in your PyTest options, you have to disable to run the debugger in PyCharm, and I find it annoying. Uh, another problem I see, I, we also use AOHTTP, and there's a plugin for it in PyTest. If you don't install it, nobody will complain, but the test will just run endlessly. Uh, so the, these are small things that annoy you, but it's not... Off. Okay, uh, then, okay, let's be super fast about the rest. Flake it is used for linting. It's not the most common tool, but it's the one I like. PyLint is more common. They all work. They're all good, more or less. They all enforce the same standard. Uh, Black uh, is a formatter. We have seen this morning a talk from one of the developers. It's it's very good. Autopepate is maybe as good as Black, but... Black has this nice thing that it doesn't have options, so you don't need to discuss about this stuff. One out of five, very good. Uh, and the tool that wrap up all the, some of the tools we have mentioned before is PyScaffold. I contributed to it because we use it extensively. It allows you to create directory structures for your projects with everything pre-configured. It's very customizable. It gets a three out of five because if you want to update from one PyScaffold version to the next, it's a pain, and uh, because it picks tools that are, yes, consolidated, but still it's not necessarily the best way to work. I'm trying to make them support poetry, but it's still not there yet. Again, this is um, a, a, an overview, the same overview we saw before. It's telling that the packaging uh, circle is empty because everybody that tries to handle packaging also try to handle distribution in some form or another. Um, and that's it. You can find the slides on uh, uh, GitHub pages. Uh, they are the same as you're seeing now. You can contact me on LinkedIn or Telegram. And thanks, everybody. Bring out the questions. We are hiring a senior data engineer. Thank you, everybody. Right. Thank you very much. We ha we had to like jump into the Q and A time a little because the questions you can of course ask outside of the Q and A format as well. Just come over. But we do have time for maybe two questions. Two minutes. I see one right here. Yes. Thanks for the talk. Uh, in comparison to all these tools that seem to rate pretty highly on your WTF scale, uh, are there other languages or tool chains that you find to be much better? Well. Uh, I came, I come from Scala and there you have SBT that is not the best, but in Java you have Maven. Maven is harder to use in general, but then it delivers and you have a centralized option for everything. I play around a bit with Ruby and it seems okay, but I'm not an advanced user. So maybe other people will have more complaints for sure. The effort to understand the whole big picture is much easier in other languages where you have one entry point or two at most, and everything inside is inside. So, yes, Java for me is a good option for that. Uh, thanks for the talk, and that was a nice info. Uh, so, what do you personally use for environment? Which tool do you use? And why does Pippin we get what the fuck score three? Uh, a, a good question, because uh, clearly to present a meaningful picture, I also had to include tools that I didn't extensively use personally. So I researched this a bit. I tried to uh, survey people like on Lobsters or on other websites. And there was some complaint about PPEMV. I, I don't have a personal experience with it. We use Poetry now. We use PyP 
Puppy server. So we build our packages. Now we, we understood and learned from our mistakes. I use personally V0LM, but this is a personal choice. I know it's weird. Um, what else? We still use setup tools for a couple of packages because of C extensions and static libraries. Poetry makes it a bit harder to integrate them. So we saw no value in doing that. Also, C ext- when you want to include C code with this, it's another layer of pain that uh, I didn't talk about. Uh, what else? We use Flakate, Auto Pepate, so and we use PyScaffold, so the whole suite of PyScaffold. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. So feel free to ask questions, but in more informal kind of way. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You.